morning. I'd like to welcome you all here to Pine Grove Baptist again this morning. And I, um, you know, all of you know I work with or teach the young kids, and I love it. And I've had people say, "How do you, how do you do it with, with the kids and stuff?" But you know, it's not just their little hugs and them saying, "Well, Miss Luann, I love you." But I have my notes written on my bulletin that the preacher gave me this morning. <laughs> They're in here somewhere with all this other little purple, these little purple hearts. <laughs> And it says, I love you so much. That's what it's all about, is just the kids are genuine. And um, they just touch my heart. I don't know why I even said that. I guess it's because I'm trying to find my notes. But um, anyway, some of the notes we have, or some of the um, announcements is that choir practice is going to be at 6 o'clock Wednesday night. And then at 7 is we'll have our Bible study out here in the sanctuary. And it's going to be, Where is America in the Last Days? And the preacher's going to take the scripture from Ezekiel 38 and 39. And we are going to have homecoming this year. It's going to be on April the 3rd. So we want to make sure that you invite your family and friends. And it seems like it's been a while since we've done that. And we just want this to be the best homecoming we've had for us to all get together and just fellowship. Um, and there's going to be a short meeting, uh, let's see, when is March 16th, right after Bible study, for those who are interested in taking part in Operation In As Much and want you to come with any ideas you have and just get together and see what we can do this year. And one of the main and important things is don't forget to move your clock back. No, we're moving it forward an hour for next Sunday for Daylight Savings Time because you want to make sure you get here on time. Because you don't want to miss any part of anything that God has for us here with Sunday school, preaching, because God is in our presence here at Pine Grove. And if you're missing any of the services, then you're missing a lot of his blessings here. And another thing is that we want to update the prayer list. So if there's anything that, any names that needs to be added, or needs to be taken off to please mention it to Miss Catherine. And I think that's it. You're going to do Okay. <laughs> You're right. Uh oh. <laughs> So they're different on the outside, 
than they are on the inside. So here's like when I open a couple of them up, all of them are chocolate, aren't they? Yeah. Everyone else chocolate. So you know what this message tells me? What's that? That Jesus loves everybody, right? Yeah. Did he make everybody alike? Yeah. No. 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 She's got long hair. Yes. You got curly hair. Yeah. You got straight hair. I got pretty hair. And you got pretty hair. <laughs> That's right, you got pretty hair. But you y'all all look alike? No. No, y'all don't look alike at all. No. Y'all are like these M&Ms. You're different colors. You're different people on the outside. But when you open up the inside of the M&M, are you the same? No. Yes, you are. In the inside, you're the same. In the outside, you're that's right. On the outside, we're different because God made us all different. But on the inside, we are the same. You're not chocolate on the inside, and you're not vanilla on the inside, and you're not green on the inside. We're all the same on the inside. So God made us all the same. Yes. And do y'all know the song? Uh, let's see what the song is. Jesus loves, Jesus loves the little children. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you this. How about this? Y'all are little children now. Jesus loves y'all, right? Yeah. Jesus loves the little children, don't he? Yeah. All the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Now, turn around and look at the people out there. Guess what? I know y'all are not going to believe this. But they were little children at one time. <laughs> Can y'all believe that? Yeah. Can you believe your nanas and all of them were little children at one time? Yeah. Did Jesus love them then? Yes. Does he love them now? Yes. So when you get as big as they are, he's going to love you just as much now as he will when you get that old. Yeah. So isn't that something? So as you go through the week, you just know, just think, Eminem, I'm just like everybody else. But if you get a baby, you, you, you have to go to the doctor. Yeah, when you get a baby, you go to the doctor. That's right. Okay, here, I'm going to do something, and Angel's probably going to kill me. So don't go for these.
do this, y'all. Bo's sitting back there. I am so glad to see Bo and Patsy in church today, and I know y'all are too. God has blessed us. Now, if I can do this without crying, we'll be okay. 573, please stand.
I was caught off guard, so I'm gonna, we'll try to do it, okay? Like a babe when it cries for its mother Like a child I was helpless and alone Then I met the Master Now I am one of is the more for all things were changed when he found me new day broke through all around me for I met belong to man walks in darkness I had longed I had searched for a light then I met this master now I walk I walk no more in the night for all things were changed when he found me a new day broke through all around me for I met this master appreciate that oh I got an email this week from missionary friends over in Belgium we've been communicating back and forth for I guess over a year now and some of you I brought this uh, letter copy of the conversation and as you began to read it, when you got about halfway down, it was sort of disturbing. I think he said there was around 890 million people lives in Europe. Only 1.1% are evangelical Christians. In Belgium, it's 0.5%. Now, over in the Ukraine, which has been getting a lot of attention lately, most of those people over there that's being killed are lost without Christ. Richmond County, 
and this country is on the fast track to be just like the rest of the world. You know that? And it's so disturbing because some of us has children, grandchildren, brothers and sisters that you've never once asked them about their soul. And you probably know they're hell bound right now. I don't know what it's going to take to wake up the church folks, to wake up our kin folks. But it's disturbing to know that all those millions, 1.1% are evangelical Christians. I'm glad that I met the master though, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm glad I met him. Life's never been the same for me. And if you met him, I'm sure you could say the same thing. If you have a copy of God's Word with you today, I encourage you to turn to the book of Acts. I had a professor at Fruitland said that the book of Acts should have been called the book of the Holy Spirit. Because you see how active the Holy Spirit was in the book of Acts. We begin reading here in verse number 26 of the 8th chapter. I'm not going to read all of the verses that I've chosen, just a few. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying... Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasures, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this portion of the reading of your word. Lord, we thank you for answer prayer. Because we see the answer today. We thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you more for grace because grace is more than mercy. And Lord, we thank you for this story here. This story of these two men and what happened as a result of their meeting. Father, if there's one here today who don't know you personally, I pray that they'll meet the master here today and their life will be forever changed. Bless your word, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. He just finished doing business for the queen. Now, I know it said he came to worship, but the Bible also said that he was in charge of all of her treasures. So I believe that he was there on personal business for his queen. But why he was there, he wanted to go worship. Today, Jerusalem is the home of the three major religions. Judaism, of course, is the most dominant in Jerusalem, 
followed by Islam, followed by Christianity. Jerusalem, however, is a secular city. There's a lot of unbelief in that city. It was while traveling back home, the Ethiopian, that is the treasurer, life was about to change. You see, he left Jerusalem somewhat confused and disappointed after he left worship. I don't know if you get that, but there was something missing after his worship. You know, sometimes we leave church and we miss it. We didn't pay attention. We didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. We just missed it. He being in the city of all these temples and synagogues all around, maybe he was looking for the truth, hoping to find it. I'm sure this was not the first time that he's been to Jerusalem. I'm sure he's been there on business before. Chances are he was looking for the, the answer of life, the question of life. And he stopped off to worship in Jerusalem because I'm going to tell you, there was all kind of places there of all kind of people that worship all kind of gods. Maybe there was a cross over a building that he'd never seen before. Maybe it was the first time he actually seen a cross, I don't know, over a building. And he said, maybe I need to go in there and check this religion out. But we do know that he was somewhat confused after his worship. While on his way home entered Philip. Thank God for Philip. Philip had been in what I call a good old Holy Ghost revival. Now some of us have never been in one of those, or had a part of one of those. But Philip was enjoying a great, great Holy Ghost revival. People was being saved. Miracles was happening. Uh, evil spirits were being cast out of people. It was what I would say was a really Holy Ghost revival. People were being set free. I cannot believe of any preacher stopping in the middle of a Holy Ghost revival while all this was going on. Could you? Who would want to leave something like that? You know, we have revivals and nobody gets saved. We have revivals, you might have one or two get saved. But what happens if a bunch of people get saved and a bunch of people gets healed and evil spirits cast out of people? You don't want that to stop. But he did not stay there. The key to understanding why he left is, is this. Why did he leave this great, great meeting that was going on? One word, obedience. The Spirit spoke to his heart. And he said, I've got to do what the Holy Spirit asked me to do. That was the only reason he left there. A preacher or an evangelist would have had to be out of his mind to leave something like that. Because usually that's once in a lifetime event. It's curious how God puts people in our lives at special times and special places. Have you ever thought about that? That the people that God has put you with all through the Bible, God puts people for certain reasons together. There was Paul and Ananias. Paul has just been delivered on the Damascus Road. He was now a believer. He used to be a butcher. 
He was killing people that was Christians. And there was Ananias, a follower of God. And God says, Ananias, I want you to go down. There'll be a man there named Saul who later became Paul. I've got a job for you to do. Ananias probably thinking God has lost it. He said, God, th this man has brought much havoc to the church. He's a terrible person. He's a chosen vessel. Did you notice God didn't even argue with him? He's a chosen vessel. Again, Ananias was obedient. I'm going. And then there was David and Jonathan, best friends. Best friends. How many times did Jonathan intervene on David's behalf because his father was out to get David? And then there was Mary and Elizabeth. Have you just noticed how God puts us together? Who is that person God put you in the way of that maybe helped you to grow and mature as a Christian? Who did God put in your path that may have witnessed to you and you became a Christian. Have you ever thought about them people anymore? I am so thankful that God has put a many a people in my path. It's just something that I cannot forget sometime how these people has meant so much to me in my life. What is so fascinating, God orchestrated these two men to meet one day. And there are people that come across our path, maybe just one time. And you remember something that they said that encouraged you. And ever since then, those words has helped you get through some tight spots. Maybe many times a person has helped you in your walk with the Lord. I've mentioned my father quite a bit. He had a great influence on my life, uh, helped me in so many ways, but there's been others. There's been others. This story is about two men that met one day and one time only. One was looking for the way the other one knew the way. One was a long way from home. The other one knew where home really was at. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Therefore, God sent one of his messengers to give Philip an urgent message. Go and see this Ethiopian so he can take the gospel back home to his people. Let's see how our story begins. First thing I want to call your attention to is in verse 26. It says, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Now I want to notice, I want you to notice something. Every time in the Bible when an angel speaks, Usually the first thing out of the fear not. It doesn't say that here, does it? That's kind of unusual. You know why? Because Philip had many encounters with the angel of the Lord. He didn't have to tell him no more. Fear not, Philip. Mm -mm. Philip already had been acquainted with the angel of the Lord. Isn't that nice? Now, I'm going to tell you, I've never seen an angel. I married an angel. <laughs> but I've never seen one. Now, I think if that was to happen, the first thing is going to call, don't panic, it's an angel. But he lets it be known, an uh, angel of the Lord spake to him, and he didn't have to say, fear not. Many encounters with this. And by the way, 
when you see the angel of the Lord, it's a special angel, folks. It's not a regular angel, okay? I love it when he says that. He spoke to him. An uh, angel of the Lord speaking to sinful men and women. When this particular angel appears, it's usually followed by a special assignment. Did you notice that? Look here in verse 26 again. It says right here, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, until the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza. You know, when they come, you got something to do. You got an assignment. Now, it's still confusing why he had to leave such a great, great Holy Ghost revival and go see one person. But you'll find out later on just how important it was. But it, it's... It usually comes with an assignment. I'm afraid that some of us has had encounters with angels and don't know it. My Sunday school teacher, Mr. Ruby Buechner, who I mentioned many times, who's in heaven today, was an angel, I think, on a Sunday morning when she said, if God has called you to do something, do it. That's like a fresh word from heaven because it was when God was dealing with me about preaching. And I knew it was what it, that's what it was. I had an assignment. See, hesitation would have proven costly. Look in verse 35 for a minute. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now, if he just went down there and had a regular conversation to him, it wouldn't really matter, would it? It would just ruin everything. But hesitation sometime on our part can prove disastrous. You know, when we talk to somebody about the Lord, we're talking, you know, we, we, we beat around the bush. And before you know it, we forget what we're there to talk to them about. Just go right to it. But hesitation would have been costly because you know why? Philip, if he hadn't have talked to this Ethiopian, he'd have went back lost. And the country would have never heard about the gospel. So hesitation can prove costly. Hesitation not only uh, presented the gospel, would not have presented the gospel, it would have been costly to that nation. See, that Ethiopian, the treasurer, he took the gospel back to his homeland to share it with a lost and dying country. Just one man took the gospel back. You may be the only Christian in your family, but you got good news. God loves you. You may be the only Christian where you work at, Good news, God loves you. You may be the only Christian in your neighborhood. Good news, God loves you. 190 million people in Europe don't know this good news. Hesitation. Hesitation. But when the Spirit tells us to do something concerning salvation or to encourage someone's faith, you just simply do it. Look at verse 29 here. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. There he goes again. He was obedient. How many times has somebody came up to you and said, listen, I'm concerned over a particular person. You know, I really don't know if they're saved or not. Will you talk to him? Now, what if they'd have never said that? And that person that they was concerned about would have died. You see what I'm talking about, folks? 
You see what I'm talking about? When the Spirit tells you to do something, especially when it's about salvation, you better do it. My father told me this story. It's a sad story. I, I hate to even share it with you. He said he was coming home from work one day, and there was a boy out in the yard crippled. Legs bent all out of shape. He stood on these two crutches, and he said, he said, son, I want to tell you, he said, I've never had this feeling but that one time. He said, the spirit came upon me, he said, Carl, go pray for that boy that he can walk. And he said, I didn't do it. He said, I, if I'd have prayed for that boy, he'd have walked. He said, I walked home knowing that I should have done that, but I didn't. And he said, every time I see somebody in that condition, that reminds me that I disobeyed the Spirit of God when God wanted to do a miracle in that boy's life. Can you think how many people that would have affected if he'd have been obedient? And folks, when it comes to salvation, we better move. Let us get used to doing what the Holy Spirit encourages us to do. Let's just get used to doing it. Now let us not quench the activity of the Holy Spirit. How many times have we done that? How many times it, it, it looks like we were just on the verge of having a great fulfilling of the Holy Spirit and we kill it. Just kill it dead. God, the Holy Spirit, is grieved over that. But how many times have we done it? Think if Philip said, well, I'm not going down there. I'm just not going. You see how important it is to do what the Spirit tells us to do. This whole story is about Philip and this Ethiopian unit and the urgency of reaching this one man for Christ. The unit was on his way home. And we see a few verses later, Philip being led by the Holy Spirit was given this assignment. Now what is so funny about this, I, I love this part. Jerry, I used to could run pretty fast for a short distance. I said I was a Cadillac. I could move for a little while, but I had to get that gas station. I could run, but I have never been able to run and keep up with a horse. It's impossible to do. Have you picked up on this story? There was the unit in the, on the chariot riding, and the next thing you know, there's Philip galloping along right beside of him. He was the quickest man in the world, and he could run a marathon. But he still could not run a horse. But according to the scriptures, he was running right beside of him. You know, you might could do that if you got the Holy Ghost in you. <laughs> you just might be able to outrun a horse. But he had this assignment. And when you and I are operating under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we can do anything. He can move us in mysterious ways. Not only did the angel of the Lord speak to Philip, but secondly, the angel of the Lord produced an incredible act upon Philip by doing this. Angels are messengers of God. They're very powerful. One angel killed 186 Syrians in one night. Angels can carry out requests request from God. They watch over me and you at night. They watch over us. Urgency of the matter at hand. Salvation is a must. They had to, we had to reach him, he said. The unit was ready for salvation by this time. He'd been to the Jerusalem. His soul was hungry for the truth. 
He was wide open for the gospel. And there comes Philip. Philip compliance and the units converging. You see that in 37 and 38. He left the great revival to go reach this man because this unit was ready for salvation. Brothers and sisters, opportunities are all around us. Now because so much lostness where you and I live. I believe God has put people in our lives for us to tell them I have good news. God loves you. That's what the world needs to hear. Three things in enclosing that brought these three men together. The message spoken by the angel. That was one of them. The angel had some very important news to tell Philip. In the midst of the greatest revival Philip probably ever been in, this angel had a message. And then we see the heart of an evangelist. God, I don't know what you're doing, but I've learned to obey you. And I'm going down there, and I'm going to find that man, and I'm going to witness to him, and I'm going to tell him about the Lord. Because I love to share the word of God. I might have another revival. And then the seeking of a lost sinner. My father said for 14 years, no Christian asked him to go to church. They would walk by him on Sunday morning with their Bibles tucked up under their arms. Not one of them asked him, Carl, how about coming to church? To the first pastor this church ever had, came by one Saturday and said, Carl, what you doing tomorrow? He said, nothing. He said, good, I'm here at 9.30 tomorrow morning. I'm picking you up. You come into church with me. And my father got so mad that he didn't want to go. But he said, I said, I'll be here at 9.30. My father said, son, I went out there and I watched it. I looked at my clock. He said, if he's not here at 9.30 on the dot, I'm not going. And he said, I happened to look down the road. And, it, and he said, he pulled up. Now he said, oh, Lord, it's 9.30. He said, I ought to have the sense enough then to know something was about to happen. He said, I come to Pine Grove. And he said, after Sunday school, there used to be an old pump here somewhere, pumping water. Men get the water hand. He said, Frank Gibson, he said, Carl, if you drink of that water, you are thirsty again. But there's another drink of water. If you drink of that, you will never thirst no more. And he said that morning, Brother Langley, he said he was running from one end of the... I want to tell you, just like he told me, he said, he, son, he was preaching and sling a snot everywhere. <laughs> he said, I got under conviction. And he said, when he gave the invitation, my knuckles turned white. And Frank Gibson turned around and seen him and walked back there. He said, Brother Carl, would you like me to walk down to the aisle with you? He said, come on, brother, let's go. He said, I got out of my seat a dead man. Walked the aisle, my heart began to beat an alive man. He said, I found the Lord that morning. He said, I went home and told your mama. And said, she got saved that Sunday night. One man asked him to come. Isn't that something? The message today is most urgent. Because I believe time's running out. He said, oh, I've heard that so much. It may be running out because somebody died today. You know it? Somebody had died this morning, not ready to meet the Lord. Before you go to bed tonight, thousands would have died without Christ. Are any of those people your people? Have you ever shed some tears over your children 
and the way that they're living. Don't go to church. Don't seem to care. You, you didn't raise them that way. Do you really, really care? Well, you got an assignment just like I have, every one of us. Go. <laughs> Go. Because you and I have good news. God loves you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story that actually happened. We thank you, Lord, that Philip was obedient to the Spirit and left that great Holy Ghost revival to go see this one man who was seeking the Lord. And he found him. And he won him to the Lord. And he took the gospel with him to his nation. Only you and only you know how many people came to know the Lord by these two men brief encounter. Lord, you work that way. And Lord, I pray today that if we've got children, grandchildren, mother and fathers that we know are lost, unchurched, that the altar will be flooded with tears for their souls. Bless this invitation. For we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Did you go take a few looks and turn to 361? Mm -hmm.